Genesis chapter 3. Let's turn there. Genesis chapter 3. I fear cold weather is going to move in this week. Am I right or wrong? Really? Snow? Not yet, huh? Not yet, JR. Not yet. Huh? Rain tonight. Not freezing rain, I hope. Um, those northern people come down and make fun of us for our lack of snow. And when we get snow, we don't drive too well. I've been up north. Kind of flat up there. So come down here in the Ozarks, and when you get a little snow, it's a little bit different story. Or you go over into Tennessee and the Appalachians. Anyway, Genesis chapter 3. Appreciate you being here uh, this afternoon. Those of you online, Sweetie Pie is watching, tuning in. Uh, we have people telling us that... Um, there's an issue with our audio, and I'm doing everything I can to chase it down, and I have no idea what's wrong. Um, I've adjusted settings, I've tweaked things, I've turned things down, I've, and it doesn't, uh, the reports we got this morning was that it was on the sermon audio uh, feed, because we send out two live feeds. One of them sermon audio, one going to Facebook, and on the sermon audio feed, there was audio problems. On the Facebook, there wasn't, and I don't understand that, how it's the same feed going two different places, and one of them has audio problems, the other one doesn't. So, um, uh, you know, I'm going to try to uh, maybe do a little research and try to figure out what that is. But uh, just be patient with us and pray for us. Um, you know, it may be something simple, maybe something complicated and expensive, maybe, maybe a devil in the wiring. You know, who knows? So I always thought it was funny that I'd get ready to do something on Pastor Mike online and the internet goes out at 11.55. Tuesday and Thursday. I always thought that was curious. I don't know. Anyway, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, let's start in... Uh, let's see here. Where do I want to start tonight? Uh, verse... Verse 9. Uh, the story is, we've gotten to the part where... Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit that God told them not to eat of. And um, he gave them grace in one way, wherein God said, In the day ye eat thereof, uh, ye shall surely die. Well, he gave them grace. There's two ways God says the word day. A day is 24 hours. A day is a thousand years. So God could have minute 24 hours and Adam could have died while it was in his mouth. He could have. But God gave him grace. He allowed him to live 930 years, but not a thousand years. Nobody did. And so God allowed him grace uh, to live out to his... And some, I don't, you know, knowing what I know about salvation and the Bible and heaven and this life, you've got people right now working feverishly on extending human life, okay? Working, do it by technology or by altering mankind's genetics so that man can live four, five, six hundred years. I don't want to. There's no way. Down here, there's nothing that I want to live another 400 years down here for. Nothing. Um, 
So uh, I'll take my life up in heaven. But there, uh, people are dead serious about this. Um, I won't get into all that tonight because I'll chase a bunch of rabbits. Uh, but anyway, verse 8. Uh, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? In verse 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? The man said, um, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. The Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. All those statements were, of course, true. And the Lord said unto the serpent, uh, and again, this is what I said last Sunday night. They both admitted it. They both admitted it. I want you to notice that God did not ask the serpent anything. That just occurred to me. I never thought about that before. God asked Adam, what have you done? Adam admitted it. God asked Eve, what did you do? She admitted it. He didn't ask the devil. What did you do? Didn't ask him. Why do you think that is? I think I have an answer, but... Well, I mean, he knew what, he, he knew what Adam was going to say, and he knew what Adam was already going to do. He knew what Eve was going to do. He knew the serpent would lie. Okay, that's, that's probably a good answer. Uh, I didn't ask you up there, man upstairs. Yes, man upstairs? No redemption. God was going to forgive Adam and Eve, but he does not forgive angels. That's one thing you ought to be thankful for about being a human. When God made all of these angels out of the limitless, infinite number, innumerable company of angels that he made, he never offered redemption and forgiveness to any of them. So that if any of them sinned, too bad. Too bad. So God has told us in the book of Psalms, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. So yes, we are made lower than the angels. But God has given us the gift of redemption and forgiveness. And that is not something he has offered to any angels. When they sin... They're doomed, period, the end. And so, but I just, I never, that thought never occurred to me until just looking at that now. So, um, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all every, every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and thus shalt thou eat all thy days, all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head. Thou shalt bruise his heel. And then uh, tonight we'll talk about this and maybe get into a little bit about what God said to Adam. But uh, to the woman, he said this, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto the dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Father, we pray, dear God, that you would open our eyes to your word tonight and uh, give us some good things that will help us, some things that will keep us and encourage us. We know not what this week will bring. Father, we know that you have brought all of us through this last week. We thank you for it. And Father, lead us guidely and 
safely through another week or take us home to be with you. Father, whichever one you pick is good enough for us because we know, Father, your grace is manifested to us here on this earth and we thank you for that grace. So, Father, we ask, God, that you just open our eyes tonight to your word. We love you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Um, let's go back to verse 16. Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. I'm not, I, I don't know all that much about uh, the birth process of various animals across the world, uh, whether it be dogs or kitty cats or cows or horses uh, or giraffes. I think you women would be glad you're not giraffes. Amen. Um, but I, I don't, you don't hear in the animal world, you don't hear, and I'm just going to be blunt, you don't hear the screaming of a female animal that's involved in giving birth. I mean, dogs give birth to multiple puppies. Um, Pigs to multiple piglets. Cows usually only give out one calf at a time, and that's how it is with some in the animal world. Uh, but some others, they put out multiple things. Um, you don't hear fish screaming, okay, when they lay eggs. Uh, but with woman, uh, apparently it is a, I can't speak because I don't know, but apparently it is an extremely painful process. And so God seems to have reserved this pain in de the deliverance of newborn, the newborn of the species, whatever it is, God seems to have reserved that amount of pain to, and the sorrow even before the birth. I mean, I, I was back there to look at Alicia and she was trying to situate herself and her face was going, it was like she was already having. But anyway, um, you don't see that among the animal kingdom, but you see it in, in humans. So this, I mean, this Bible's, if, if evolution is what everybody says it is, which it's not, why would the human species in, the, in its genetics, why would the human species, as it's evolving, why would the DNA choose to inflict pain upon the woman in childbirth when apparently there isn't that much pain involved in the other species of animals? And I would say including chimpanzees, okay? Which they say we came from, our, our monkey relatives, don't seem to be having that much problem with it. So why didn't why did evolution put that one on you women? If you if you are a woman, you should never be an evolutionist because it doesn't make sense, doesn't add up. Amen. But that's something that God um, placed upon woman. That's the curse of it. And if you know Jesus, that's the limit of it. I preached this morning on being a loving father and as, as a love, if you're, if you're a parent and you love your children, when you have to discipline them, when you have to give them spanking, you give them loving restraint in that spanking. You don't just unload the forces of hell on your child and hope to kill them. Uh, you restrain yourself because you love your child. Okay. Um, so uh, turn to John chapter, I don't remember why I was going with that. That was a good illustration, but I don't remember what the meat, the, the meat of it was. So turn to John 16 while I'm fumbling here. John chapter 16. There is a, there's a meaning behind everything that God does. A very, a very uh, prophetic meaning. When I ask God what to start reading 
concerning where I'm going to find Bible prophecy, Revelation or Daniel. Uh, God didn't limit me. He said, just read, read. And what God was doing was God knew that even though I knew some things out of the Bible, there was a lot more I needed to know. So I set myself to reading the scriptures and, and just reading everywhere, everywhere that God would lead me, everywhere my interest took me, wherever. I've been just reading the scriptures, reading, reading, reading. And uh, some people ask, how do you know what's the right thing to read? And when it comes to the Bible, there is no wrong thing to read. Read it. Read it. Amen. Uh, that's like asking which end of the hamburger are you supposed to eat first? Eat the hamburger. Amen. So anyway, uh, there seems to be a, a, a prophecy behind these things that there's a reason why God does what he does. Um, you're there in John 16, but let me read a verse to you very quickly if I can get to it quickly. If not, then it'll take me a while. First uh, Thessalonians 5. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Now, it's interesting to me that God associated and we're probably going to go this direction here in a little bit, but God associated his appearance in the air. And the timing of that with childbirth. He associated it with the birthing of a child, the birthing of a baby. Uh, and you've heard me talk about the appearance of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2. Right now, nobody knows who the Antichrist is. I don't, you don't, Jack Van Impey doesn't know, and he's put out videos. And other people have, have said, I know the identity of the Antichrist. It's whoever. That they, we don't know. It's not revealed to us yet who this is. And the, the illustration that I have is it's like a baby before we had ultrasound. Before ultrasound, we didn't know the condition of the baby. We didn't know the gender of the baby. We didn't know the face of the baby. We didn't know anything about it. We waited until the birth. Then we knew. Now they run all kinds of tests and they can pretty much tell you. Here's the baby's blood type and here's the baby's this and the baby's that. And they can, and in 10 years, 20 years time, who knows? Women might not even be having, I, I look for them to remove women from that curse as well. Here, we have a laboratory for you to have your child in. Okay, science fiction becomes science fact. And so that, that may very well be, but... Um, but anyway, with the idea of the Antichrist, he's not revealed yet. So it's like a child in a womb. It's like Ichabod being still in the womb. And then he's born. And then God says his name is Ichabod. The glory has departed. So he's a picture of the Antichrist. And, and the Bible says in that story that she travailed in her birth pains. Well, that gives you an indication that that story is linked to the timing or something that has relevancy to the rapture of the church. So, John chapter 16 is a passage of scripture that I think falls it also into that category. Uh, number one, it has multiple applications. You can look at it as a, in, when anybody is in any form of generalized sorrow, no matter what the source of it, no matter what the reasoning for it is, uh, there is to us who believe there is coming a time when all of our sorrows are going to end. And, and I, and I, if I, if I can encourage God's people in these days, when, you know, look around you, there's empty pews, empty pews, empty pews, empty pews. And yet there are probably churches tonight where there's full, 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 full. Okay. Well, let me take that back. The coffee shop type churches and the seeker friendly type churches and the mega church type churches quit having Sunday night service a long time ago. Okay? To them, this is not the Lord's day anymore. Okay? 
hurry up and go to church so you can go enjoy everything else. And I saw that coming years ago. Um, but in, in today's world, if I can encourage the true believer into anything, yes, living for God, especially in this time, is going to bring sorrow. It is gonna, you are going to bring trouble down on, in, on yourself. If you try to live for God and you try to do what's right, there is going to be trouble in your life. The devil is going to make sure of it. The devil is going to try to turn each one of us into Job before we leave out of here. Okay? I believe that. That doesn't sound very promising. doesn't sound very encouraging. But what I will tell you is, I promise you, in the first five seconds, past either the translation or your death, you will be glad that you endured it. You will be glad you went through it. And the illustration is here in John 16, verse 20. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Verily means truly, 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 I say unto you. It's a double truly. I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament but the world shall rejoice. And that's how it's shaping up. The world rejoices. The world pats itself on the back about its inventions and, and about um, how the, the wickedness of this world and how we can congratulate those brave people who come out as transgendered. Those are not brave. Omaha Beach, that's brave. Okay, but see, that's what I'm talking about. And so he says, the world shall rejoice. That's the world. And ye shall be sorrowful. But watch this. Here's the world rejoicing. Here's us being in sorrow. So what's God going to do? Swap places. So their rejoicing is but for a moment. So is our sorrow but for a moment. When God switches places with everybody, our joy in rejoicing is for eternity and their sorrows for eternity. Woman, um, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And then he uses this il illustration. The, and this is, if you mark in your Bible and you're in John 16, write Genesis 3 there. Next to verse 21. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. That was the very thing that God laid upon womanhood because of Eve's sin. Some might say, well, if it was Eve's sin, how come Eve don't bear the punishment for it? Leave us alone. I think that it's probably true. In fact, I know it's true. If any one of us, being the sons of Adam and Eve, were in Adam and Eve's shoes, what would we have done? The same thing. Not only would have done, did. Did. We've all had lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Is that thunder? All right. What is it, Jaden? No, I don't think it's Everett. Yeah. Uh, no marching bands this time of year. Do what? John, turn the room mics down. Yeah. All right, got it. What happens is... That vent blows on that microphone or wherever it is. Yeah. So, all right. So verse 21, a woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow. Again, tied directly to Genesis chapter three, because her hour is come. And, you know, I, I remember Lisa going through that. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth. No more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world, or it could be a girl, but in, the, in this case, and he says specifically a man. 
So what is this in reference to? This, the glorious appearing, the second coming, glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I believe that before we are translated, I believe that there will be a time of great sorrow. I do. I believe that God's people will more than likely endure a time of great sorrow in preparation for that time. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, the first five seconds in heaven, you're not going to remember the sorrow. You're not going to remember the anguish. You're not going to remember the pains of this world. You're not going to remember the sting of death. You're not going to remember anything. It's all going to be gone. And you will be glad that you endured. You will be glad that you went through. You will not be sorry that you did. I mean, think about it. In that first moment of appearing before God and God saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or us meeting Jesus in the air. And he takes us to our heavenly home. We're going, not only are we going to see God and his son, Jesus, and we're going to see all the angels of heaven. We're going to see the new Jerusalem. We're going to see it all. We're going to enjoy that for eternity. Then we're going to come back down to earth and judge the stupid people for a thousand years. Amen. We're going to judge evil angels, the Bible says. So there's, there's much to live for in the life of a Christian. There's much to gain. There is everything to lose if you don't do it God's way and everything to gain. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Verse 22, and ye now therefore have sorrow. So Christ is telling us, yes, that is going to happen. Don't listen to the Christian bookstores and the Christian TV stations telling you that you should not have any sorrow as a Christian. You should not, you should be victorious every day. You, you can be, you don't have to live in defeat. You don't have to live in, in any kind of sorrow, any kind of physical pain. You don't have to live in, under any of that. That is not true. It's not biblical. Joel Osteen's gospel and Jesus' gospel are two different gospels. That should be manifested at, who was it? Showed up. Joel Osteen's church. J, well, it's not Jay-Z. Who am I thinking of? Kanye West. That should be manifest right then and there. It's not the same gospel. Uh, so, uh, verse 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. That is an absolute promise. Underline that in your Bible. Hold on to that one. I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice. And your joy no man taketh from you. No man's going to take our joy from us. No man is going to take our eternal life from us. No man is going to take our home away from us that's in heaven. No man's going to be able to do that. And in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. In that day. Right now, we have to pray through the mediator, Jesus Christ, in order for God to be able to answer our prayers. But what he's saying, I believe what he's saying here is once we're there and we're able to see the face of God, we no longer need the mediator between us and God. He will be near to us. God himself shall be their God and they shall be his people. Uh, the holy city, New Jerusalem, is coming down from heaven. It's going to be on the earth. God himself here dwelling among mankind. Uh, verse 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. These things, verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you uh, in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs. But I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world, and go to the Father. So verse 29, his disciples said unto him, Lo, 
now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Because they didn't understand. And there were a lot of things that they didn't understand until it happened. How many times did Jesus tell them, the Son of Man must be taken and killed and rise on the third day? He told them that at least two, three times before it happened, but they did not comprehend it, did not sink in. Then when it happened, they said, that's what he was telling us. Now we understand. And so I'm going to throw in this little thing. If anybody says that they fully understand the Bible in its prophetic word is not telling you the truth. I don't think anybody can see prophecy Things that have not happened yet in their fullest reality and then declare to you that they are the only ones who have it right. So we do not require, as being a member of this church, we do not require that you must agree with Pastor Mike on everything concerning Bible prophecy. Because I'm not sure that I'm right about everything. So, but there are churches, believe it or not, that do. They require you, if you're going to join their church, they require you that you must agree with them on everything they say concerning Bible prophecy. And I don't believe that they know everything concerning Bible prophecy. Because it hasn't happened yet. So, um, verse, uh, verse 30. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee, by this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Verse 31. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is thou come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and ye shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. You also take that home with you. If you bemoan your station, your situation in life, you feel like you're alone, you have no friends, you have nobody to talk to. You do. You always do. And you've always had. This is something that I've learned. I've lost more friends in my life than I've ever gained. And it used to bother me. I used to, God, I have no friends. God, I have no friends. God, I have no friends. And God said, of course you do. You just haven't talked to him in a while. And when I realized that day that my greatest friend was my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I quit telling God I didn't have any friends. Because I do. I have one that sticketh closer than a brother. And I am never alone. Okay, how do you think these widows are getting by as good as they are? Okay, they have a savior to talk to. They have somebody to communicate with. And they would encourage you to reach out and communicate with them. Um, verse 31, Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, as now is, that ye shall be scattered, and every man to his own. Ye shall leave me alone, yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Underline that phrase. In the world ye shall have tribulation. I encourage you, do a study. I've not talked about this in a while. Do a study of the word tribulation in your Bible. It's worth it. Because I think, it's just my, my theory. When people, when, when people started asking me, Pastor, are we going to go through three and a half years tribulation, seven years tribulation? What's it going to be? I couldn't answer that question. I could not answer that question. So I, I went to the scriptures. And I wanted to know what this 
time of tribulation was. And I still, 1997, I started doing this, so that's been, what, 22 years? I still have not found a seven-year tribulation in the Bible anywhere. Never found it one time. And um, so I believe the word tribulation if you'll study that out, I don't know how long, but I think God has appointed His saints to a time of tribulation. Okay? No, we're not appointed to wrath. We're not... But a time of tribulation, yeah, I believe so. It's a time of troubling, is what it is. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen to that. Now, Isaiah 13, turn there. Isaiah 13. So, so what, part of what we, part of what we uh, were looking at in John 16 was that I believe there's a day coming that the Bible relates to the travail of a woman giving birth. Okay, We've, we read it in 1 Thessalonians 5. We read it in John 16. We see the, the foreshadowing with God telling Eve, in, in sorrow shall be thy conception. So, then, what I would encourage you to do, and I'm not going to give you a full study of this, but I would encourage you to study travailing women in the Bible. Study women that are giving birth. What are they giving birth to? What's happening around them? As in the case of Phineas's wife, we find out that the Ark of the Covenant has been taken... Eli has fallen backwards, okay, falling away taking place, and then the man of sin being revealed in the form of the child whose name is Ichabod, whose name means the glory is departed. Because he was the son of Phineas, and Phineas was an evil, he was a, he was a son of Belial is what he was. So I think that there's relevancy there. In Isaiah 13, I think there's... I think God is connecting the destruction of Babylon as well. Uh, or the downfall, maybe, of the kingdoms of this world. Isaiah 13, verse 1. The burden of Babylon, which the son of, uh, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did say, did see. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Now, verse 4. If you want to make a little note, there is a, there is a nation that is going to take over this earth. A nation of people. But I don't believe that it's the Russians... The Africans, the Chinese, the Americans, the Canadians, or the Puerto Ricans, or the Mexicans. I think it's a different type of nation. Okay? Verse 4, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people. A tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. Notice this. They come from a far country. And then he tells you, Sandy and Ron, where they come from. From the end of heaven. Where is the end of heaven? I'll just say it's a long way away from here. Okay? From the end of heaven. Even the Lord and the weapons of his indigestion. No, indignation. That's a joke. 
to destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them, and they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. And I believe this book. So here's what, here's what I think. I absolutely believe that there's coming a time. You have people in this world who are just nuts and bolts, atheist scientists. They don't believe in any God. They don't believe in any great spirit. They don't believe in any devil, of course. They don't believe in any spirits. They don't believe in anything that they cannot see in their telescopes, microscopes, measuring cups. They can, anything that they cannot see, measure, taste, touch, smell, whatever. Anything that they cannot write out in some arithmetic formula. They don't believe in it. But I believe that angels are going to fall out of the sky. And devils are going to rise up from the depths of the earth. And I think that all of these people who have decided that there is nothing supernatural in that day, is, it's got, because they believe this way, go back and look at um, verse 7. All hands, before shall all hands be faint. And every man's heart shall melt. I think these people who are all about science and logic and all of that, they are going to be completely taken by surprise. And they will not be able to have an answer for what they're seeing with their own eyes. They say, I'll believe it when I see it. They won't believe it when they see it. That's the problem. When they finally see what God has in store for this world, it's going to blow their minds because they don't have words to measure or to describe what it is that they're seeing. Okay? I absolutely think that that's going to happen. Their pangs and sorrows, fear, their hearts shall melt. That's an equivalent to what was said I think by Jesus, men's hearts failing them for fear. Literally, they are going to pe there's going to be people who are going to die of heart failure because of the fear of what they're looking at. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them, and they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one another. Faces shall be as flames. Uh, let's go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. I, I read that to you a while ago, but let me just read this again very quickly. And I'll let you go. Actually, I should have stayed in Isaiah 20. Let's do that. Let's go, to, um, let's go to Isaiah 26. Since I already read 1 Thessalonians 5, Isaiah 26. Amen. I open my Bible to Isaiah 26. What you know what jumps out at me in this chapter? There's a word there in all capital letters. Jehovah. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Amen. Now verse 16. Lord, in trouble had they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Like as a woman with child. There it is again. See, I didn't know this was in a different place in the Bible. I'd always heard, you know, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction has travailed upon a woman. I never knew that that was in the Old Testament. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. 
We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. You know, Paul said concerning, we, and we talked about this last, maybe the last lesson when we talked about the clothing that God put on Adam and Eve. That is a picture of God clothing us in righteousness. And I read that verse that Paul talked about where it said the whole creation groaneth right now. And is in travail together, earnestly, des earnestly desiring to be clothed upon. And as you and I approach, let me put it this way. As people who are dying, saints who are dying, approach their death. I've been with some of them. They were in great pain. Uh, Joe Polite, Dee's husband, was in great pain. Before he died, he died of cancer. Uh, Warren Bergman, great, tremendous pain. They just, they just basically dope these people up on morphine or whatever. And just because they are in great pain. And you have all these saints who are in great pain and sorrow as the time of their death approaches. But as soon as they draw that less breath and their soul leaves their body, that pain is over with. It's gone. It is gone. Just like when a woman gives birth to a child, as soon as that child is delivered, that pain is gone. Amen. Okay. And this is, this is the analogy here. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth. Neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Verse 19. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise? That's Christ talking. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is the dew of herbs. And the earth shall cast out the dead. And that's what's going to happen at the rapture. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. In the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So whether or not we are travailing and we're going to be alive on the day of the Lord's appearing. And we are travailing in sorrow as we live on this earth because of the things that are going on in this world. Or God has appointed to us to die before that day happens. And as our death is approaching, there just seems to be something about death that hurts. If it's got to kill you, Sterling, it's got to hurt for some reason. But as soon as we draw that last breath, that pain's gone. And we're free from all that pain. Not just that pain, but all the pain of life. All the heartache and sorrow that we, all the funerals we attended, all the people we buried, all the things that we did wrong, all the sorrow that this life brought, all of that gone. Just like that, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And I say it's worth it. And I haven't experienced it. I have been to heaven. I don't know that kind of joy yet. I know a lot of heartache. I know a lot of pain. I know a lot of fear. But I don't know a lot of joy yet. But I still say when we get there, it'll be worth it. Amen? Amen. I believe it will. So I encourage everybody, teach this to your children. We're afraid. I was always afraid when I was young. I was afraid, J.R. and Callie, that I wouldn't get to grow up and experience life. I was afraid the Lord was going to come when I was 16 years old and bum me out. I heard Ken Goff, my preacher, say, I believe the Lord will come back in my lifetime. He's dead. Didn't happen. But he's coming. He's still coming. Amen? Let's stand. Maybe one of these Sunday nights, I'm going to preach for six hours straight and the Lord will come. And as we all pass each other in heaven, you'll pass the Lord and say, God, thank you for this. Father, we love you. We don't like 
the suffering. We don't like the heartache. We don't like the body ache. We don't like the headaches. We don't particularly like suffering. But it does seem like we're often appointed to it. We don't like the grief that comes with this world. But it seems like we find more than our share of it. And I understand, God, that you picked everybody that you picked to live in the day that they lived. And you picked us to live in this day. We certainly don't know when the day of the Lord is going to be. We certainly don't know when the end of all of God's saints' heartaches and trials is going to be over with. There may be some even amongst our number who depart this life before that day ever happens. But Father, we know, because of what we believe in this book, we know, God, that the life that you have waiting for us on the other side, even if we only got to live it a minute, would far outweigh the pain, the sorrow, the heartache, and all the other aches that we've endured in this world. And Father, we thank you for such a captain as our Jesus, who came down here to live this life with us. To know what it's like both to suffer, to know what it's like to be tempted, to know what it's like to lose loved ones, to know what it's like himself also to die. Die a painful death he did. He knows what it's like. We thank you for such a great captain who knows what it's like to go through what we're going through. And I believe, Father, that you've ordained it that way. That's why you're going to raise us up higher, even higher than the angels of heaven. You've made us lower than the angels. And I believe you'll raise us higher than the angels. Or at least to be with them for all of eternity. We thank you, God, that at least for us, you've offered the chance for forgiveness of our sins. For that forgiveness, we thank you tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.